Greetings, everybody, and welcome back to the second half of this short two-part series on understanding how the media potentially influences and affects public policy. Last time, I recapped some of the major changes that have occurred across the United States in relation to gun control and the ongoing attention that is being paid to anti-gun protests and demonstrations that have continued to occur and have continued to sweep across the nation in the five months since the tragic shooting at Parkland at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. We have covered the basic concepts of adolescent egocentrism that may have played a role there, but more importantly, we covered something about agenda setting and cultivation and what roles those effects may play in determining how the most important issues that concern American citizens become the most important issues that concern American citizens. Do they come about naturally, or are they influenced by media in terms of the extent and length of coverage? In addition to seeing that the amount of time that the media spent on a certain story influenced what Americans felt the most important problem facing them was, we saw some other results as well. We saw, for example, that anger and fear both also have a role to play in what Americans were concerned with in their daily lives. That fear forwarded greater deference, while anger forwarded greater desire for action and for vengeance. Further, we know that the news media generally determines maybe not how we think about things, but what we think about, and as such, potentially also what we fear, what we're fearing because it's in our mind space. But nothing affects our fear greater, as we saw, than personal experience with criminal victimization. So in other words, we've seen the media has some ability to affect us, and we've seen that plenty of times in the past. But just what role does the media really ultimately have on legislators, on making laws, on changing public policy? Well, today, let's answer that question. It seems that it is undeniable, given everything that we've learned, that the media does affect public perceptions on some level, if not entirely how we think about things, at least, again, what we think about as a function of agenda setting. Then we have to really ask, is it possible that the media is responsible on some level for the influx of, in this instance, so many gun laws that we've seen passed somewhat recently and somewhat silently over the past five months, while the media's attention remains on the young faces leading the cause? Could it be that the media is responsible on some level for this? More importantly, though, does this individual finding that we're seeing in the case of the Parkland effect I mentioned before, does that have any kind of reach or extension outside of that specific example? Well then, let's introduce the entire concept this is based upon, the CNN effect. John Roberts, go ahead, John. No, no. John Roberts, go ahead. CNN's fake news, I don't take questions. I don't take questions from CNN. CNN is fake news. I don't take questions from CNN. John Roberts of Fox. The CNN effect is a hypothesis that has been proposed by social and political scientists for a few decades now, and I think it is of import to cover today as a potential explanation for the outcomes that we've seen over the past few months, potentially for many outcomes that we've seen in the public over the past few decades even. Thus, let's delve into the general capacity, not just the one limited to Parkland, but the general capacity for the media to potentially influence the laws of the land. Put most simply, the CNN effect is the potential for the media to play a role on policymaking, particularly given the extreme expedience at which the news cycle currently functions. Several scholars have provided different definitions for the CNN effect. Feist 2001, page 713, wrote, The CNN effect is a theory that compelling television images, such as images of humanitarian crises, cause U.S. policymakers to intervene in a situation when such an intervention might otherwise not be in the U.S. national interest. Further, according to Sabe 2002, the CNN effect is presumed to illustrate the dynamic tension that exists between real-time television news and policymaking, with the news having the upper hand in terms of influence. That's page 27. Gilboa 2005 further defined the CNN effect by how these aforementioned images, these terrible things that we see on TV, affect citizens who then in turn demand that policymakers and leaders, quote, do something to alleviate the perceived problem, thereby pressuring politicians to act in circumstances where they otherwise would not. Former Secretary General of the United Nation, Boutros Ghali, described this by calling CNN in particular the, quote, 16th member of the Security Council, in regards to the news outlet's ability to influence policy. Why would Boutros Ghali say this? I am Boutros, Boutros Ghali. 
put down your gun no! and listen to Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Well, because in earnest, given the constant rotating media carousel, legislation is often demanded before the gravitas of its impact can be properly assessed by analysts, let alone legislators, given the media pressure that's placed upon them by that said carousel. Despite the name, be aware that the CNN effect is in no way limited to the least trusted name in news. Presenting Cuck Cuomo's Cuck Queen. A Cuck Queen is a wife who is compliant in her fetish for her husband's unfaithfulness or adultery. The female equivalent of a Cuck Old. A couple things, then we'll go. One, uh, you know, you were a gift here. Everything changed when you came. So, <laughs> you're going to be great. Um, you guys, let me do my job. CNN, the most trusted name in news. It can affect pretty much anyone, anywhere, anytime, given a general media emphasis on doing something, on acting before thinking. And that's kind of why I titled the first video The Parkland Effect, because that's a very specific example of this. Although we call the theory in general the CNN effect, it really refers to media at large. But in terms of that act before you think kind of thing, be aware also with that, it's not just limited to the left, it's not just limited to CNN in terms of their politics. That can happen on either side as well. For example, while in the past in some of my videos I have lauded some of the reporting of James O'Keefe on his coverage of the Hillary campaign, and while I may potentially alienate some of you in my audience here by mentioning this, he has considerably had a less than stellar record when it comes to some honest reporting in some instances. And for the sake of trying to be fair and to illustrate how this is potentially a bipartisan issue, I feel that talking about James O'Keefe's coverage is a good topic to use as an example. Back in 2009, O'Keefe published videos on the nonprofit Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, or ACORN. Although the videos depict some scathing evidence of Baltimore Acorn employees essentially condoning child prostitution, ah, Baltimore, my old stomping ground, a city where the algae kills so many fish you could practically walk across the harbor on their dead corpses, and which can host a blog called That Guy's on Heroin, which rates a leaning factor of people well within the throes of uh, significant drug abuse. And also, hey, the most dangerous city in America for two years Omedetto. running. Congratulations, Baltimore. Omedetto to Omedetto. you. Anyway, said employees were thankfully quickly terminated. But the organization itself was investigated subsequently by numerous state and federal institutions and was found generally to be up to snuff. As most of you probably know, I'm no fan of most state or federal institutions and find them frequently highly valuable. But, as far as we can tell from the subsequent analyses of this organization, the findings of O'Keefe were not generalizable. Yes, they were fucked up, but they had very little to do with the organization as a whole. The problem is that by the time anyone got around to conduct these investigations, let alone to conclude them, the nonprofit had already lost almost all of its funding and was forced to file for bankruptcy. I'm not saying that what O'Keefe did and uncovered is entirely libelous or false. Certainly, there was some bullshit going on at a few Acorn locations, it seems. But the CNN effect is all about timeliness. And timeliness here took precedence when it came to shutting the organization's doors. The point is that the media reports on topics quickly and often in a somewhat dirty manner, for whatever sort of reason, be it political or just because you need to expedite things. And this nature of the media therefore produces public outrage, and thereby moves the needle on real-world effects in a bipartisan nature, as we've seen here with O'Keefe, and as I've mentioned before with the Parkland effect. So let's get down into this and describe in more detail what this generalizable CNN effect is, or just media effect is. 
The first references to the CNN effect started to appear around the Gulf War period, which was arguably the first major American conflict to be covered in real time under the new 24-hour news cycle by the media, thus illustrating a potential change in the landscape of politics as well as the balance of power between news media and policymakers. This was unique, this was novel to the Gulf War scenario. Thus, to define this effect in greater detail, Livingston 1997, which we'll be looking at here at length, described the CNN effect through three conceptual variants that compose it in its multiple forms. First, the CNN effect can act as an accelerant, which means that given the timeliness component of journalism, the news media reports on a story that is relevant temporally, and the more components of journalistic interest a story contains, the more likely the media is to continue to continually report upon it. Just as a quick refresher, I think I've covered this forever ago, but it's important to bring it up again. There are several components of what makes a story newsworthy in journalistic theory. And essentially, the more newsworthy a story is, the better it is for any news outlet to report upon it. It's going to get more eyes on the screen. These components of journalism are as follows. Timeliness, proximity, prominence, consequence, human interest, and conflict. Any media story need possess one to be considered newsworthy, but optimally, any story possesses two or more. And in the 24-hour news cycle that we exist in, timeliness, that is reporting on things in the quickest manner possible, is often one of the greatest aspects, or that of at least the most import. This is particularly of issue potentially to military personnel and US military operations, or any military operations, given that while the media is wont to report immediately on events as they occur, those events may be sensitive in nature and potentially endanger the lives of servicemen, a particular aspect of the CNN effect that we'll cover in just a few minutes. But despite all that, when it comes to getting a story out, often for the fourth estate, seemingly little else matters. As former State Department spokesman Nicholas Burns said on the topic, quote, In our day, as events unfold half a world away, it is not unusual for CNN to ask me for a reaction before we've had a chance to receive a more detailed report from our embassy and consider carefully our options. Illustrating how the news media is essentially, in many ways, running the show by forcing a response from politicians, lawmakers, legislators, or really anyone down the line. They ask if individuals would care to make a comment on a given crisis or situation before potentially that person has any clue what the fresh hell is going on. Similarly, and of most interest to our current topic, former Secretary of State James Baker said of the CNN effect that it, quote, drives policymakers to have a policy position. I would have to articulate it very quickly. You don't have time to reflect. In other words, politicians are seemingly forced to make decisions at the speed of the media, rather than on the considerable judgments and deliberations that they probably should be relying upon, such as we've seen of late potentially regarding these gun laws that have been put into effect over the last five months. They are working at the speed of CNN, not at the speed of their constituents. The result is such that we end up with calls to do something without any real direction of what need be done. President Trump, please do something! Do something! Action! We need it now! These kids need safety now! It's called concealed carry, where a teacher would have a concealed gun on them. They'd go for special training, and they would... Uh, be there and you would no longer have a gun-free zone. Now we're getting the same, and I'm sorry, it's a lunatic idea from the President of the United States. There could not be a worse idea for stopping another generation of the school shooting generation. I thought on arming teachers. Totally agree, it's a demented idea. I mean, aside from everything else, the dangers of it, but just think how it changes the student-teacher relationship to see them packing a gun. I mean, it, it, it's truly demented. <laughs> and no real indication of any change in the public positions towards the topic being covered, towards the topic that is being changed in the legislature. There is a false sense of urgency that is created through this effect of acceleration that places an expectation upon politicians to act before they think, to act before they have had time to carefully consider their actions, or more importantly, to poll the opinions of their constituents, to poll the people who voted for them.
There is no time for careful consideration or deliberation in the 24-hour news cycle of constant questions and bombardment with novel information. And as such, policymakers often fall victim to this seeming call to do something, do anything, even if none of the people themselves, none of their voters, are calling for said action. The second component of the CNN effect, as defined by Livingston, is kind of in contrast to the first, as it posits that while the CNN effect predicts the media's potential to influence in acting as an accelerant, it can just as easily serve as an inhibitor to policy and change in two ways, through emotional inhibition and operational security threat. In terms of emotional inhibition, a picture can tell a thousand words, and as we've seen already, media coverage can change the perceptions of a nation or even the world through imagery. Remember this image of the body of a migrant child lying on the beach, or similarly this one of another child in the back of an ambulance covered in blood? You know, I'll save my commentary on the validity of either of these images because their validity really doesn't matter now, does it, when it comes to the CNN effect and its acceleration ability. These kinds of haunting visuals immediately spark public and political outrage regardless of whether or not they were staged. Or let's think a little bit more recently to the pictures of children in cages here in the United States. Now, one of them we know that was from a protest. It was <laughs> absolutely staged. And these, further, that came out and were spread all across the mainstream media, received massive coverage and it took days for anyone to start to correctly note that said images were taken under the Obama administration. But by that point, that the points were being pointed out, the damage was long since done. Now, the media very much wanted us to see these images because they wanted that acceleration effect, right? They wanted us to see children in cages. They wanted us to see suffering children because not only does that newsworthiness as a central component of journalism, everything about these images, very newsworthy, very juicy, but also because it was in line with the politics of those behind it. But what about the images the media or even the government doesn't want us to see? That's the inhibiting factor of the CNN effect. In contrast to serving as an accelerant, in certain instances the media, or government even, in collaboration with the media, can work to suppress certain undesired images and thereby certain undesired outcomes through the dissemination, or in this case the lack of dissemination, of certain pieces of information when deemed unsuitable for the public. Friedman, 2000, noted this as the quote, body bag effect of the media. For example, during the Gulf War, the United States military took specific precautions to remove reporters from the front lines where the carnage and intense casualties of American servicemen was not so evident. They put the press pools far away from any true suffering. And as a result, many Americans had no idea about the horrors that occurred during the Gulf War until years after its cessation. Colin Powell described the separation of reporters from combat zones as worth it, having said that the American people were, quote, prepared to take casualties, and even if they see them on live television, it will make them matter. Even if they see them on live television, as long as they believe it's for a solid purpose and for a cause that is understandable and for a cause that has something to do with an interest of ours, they will not understand it if it can't be explained, which is the point I have made consistently over the years. If you can't explain it to the parents who are sending their kids, you'd better think twice about it. We certainly see plenty of this from the mainstream media today when it comes to all kinds of topics, with, for example, major news coverage of moldy locks getting socked in the face, but not really any news coverage of Antifa nutters beating Trump supporters with bike locks or throwing homemade grenades into a group of peaceful Trump-supporting protesters, because to show either of the latter wouldn't allow the media to portray Antifa as humble defenders of truth and justice. After all, Antifa isn't violent, no no, no, Antifa stands for anti-fascist. See, they're just against fascism. They're anti-Nazi and everyone hates the Nazis, right? Reducto ad Hitlerium. Wait, you're questioning Antifa? What are you, some kind of fascist? To equate a group that is a protest group, two protest groups, uh, yes, they're both protest groups, and they're talking about Antifa or Antifa, however you want to pronounce it, calling them the alt-left. Well, that group protests fascism. I can't stop you, though. Yeah. You keep using this word fascism. And 
It's awesome. <laughs> it's like the coolest word. I, is that like a hockey? Yeah, thing? no, I, I don't know. It's, I think it's some Dago word, but I, it sounds like it's a like hockey word. Doesn't it? So they were there protesting fascism. Maybe their tactics weren't exactly right. Understatement of the year, asshole. All groups uh, like that, political groups, rights groups, protest groups, it's messy. It's messy. Well, then let's make sure to never show any instances of Antifa engaging in violence and destruction of property, because otherwise, people might end up with a bad case of wrong think that just doesn't follow the desired media political narrative. This is the same reason that we continue to see in the mainstream images of a child crying for his mother being separated at the border, and these images of temporary processing centers for illegal migrants, but not this video of safe, secure, and seemingly comfortable facilities for underaged illegals. No, see if people were to be exposed to that, it wouldn't suit the story that the media is trying to tell. The ability of news media or even of governments to influence exactly what people see then is this potential inhibiting nature of the CNN effect in contrast to its accelerating nature. It is in essence framing what you see by cutting out what you don't see. Moving on though. In areas of politics that concern sensitive information, in the second aspect of the CNN effect as inhibitor, the government may wish to supersede the media given the potential for exposure of information to threaten sensitive operations. For example, in 1995 during the Bosnian War, US Air Force pilot Captain Scott O'Grady, whose name being a combination of two Ant-Men makes it absolutely impossible for me to not think about Ant-Man right now. God, that's sad. Anyway, O'Grady's plane was shot down in the thick of Serbian-held Bosnia, where he survived for six days on leaves, bugs, and rainwater until he was rescued by U.S. Marines. Now that is a goddamn man. I bet he's never been within a hundred yards of an ounce of soy. O'Grady's survival, however, was potentially seriously compromised when, during his time in the Bosnian wilderness, General Roger Fogelman, the Air Force Chief of Staff, reported to the media that they were receiving transmissions from O'Grady, which the media then, obviously, reported on en masse, and essentially, as such, informed the Bosnian-Serbian forces that O'Grady was alive and kicking around out in a woods. Unlike the other inhibiting factor mentioned above, this illustrates how there are sometimes real tactical reasons, and not just political ones, for which the government or news media need keep their big, fat mouths shut on certain sensitive topics and avoid reporting on, despite how juicy the story may be, certain aspects or operations where there are potential components that may jeopardize people's lives. Sure, it's chock full of newsworthiness, but you might just get somebody killed. It is very lucky that Captain O'Grady survived that incident, particularly given the fact that the Air Force dicked it up so hard. But thus, so far, we can see how the CNN effect can both accelerate moves towards policy and impede dissemination of information and as such also influence potential policy outcomes. Finally, the CNN effect has an agenda setting function. You know, that thing we've talked about plenty of times, which is much in line with what we've been discussing here today. That the media determines what the most important issues are, and as a result, not only can the media determine what the public thinks about, it can ultimately determine or define the most important issues that concern people. Not just people alone, though. More importantly, potentially, concern policymakers, and thereby, ultimately, the fate of nations themselves. Former Secretary of State James Baker described the agenda-setting function of the CNN effect and its ability to impact the nation by highlighting some issues over others, noting that, quote, All too often, television is what determines what is a crisis. Television concluded the breakup of the former Yugoslavia and the fighting in the Balkans was a crisis, and they began to cover it and cover it. And so the Clinton administration was left to find a way to do something. There's that term again, by the way. Yet they didn't do that in Rwanda, where the excesses were every bit as bad, if not worse. Thus, as I've mentioned before, while Parkland remains in the minds of the average person because, well, the demonstrations and protests continue to this day, the media was very quick to ignore and memory hole and forget events like the recent shooting at the Oklahoma restaurant where a gunman shot three people before his potentially otherwise unhinged rampage was quickly halted by two armed bystanders. Yeah, did you guys even hear about that story? Probably not. 
because it doesn't fit a narrative? Even the deaths of other journalists at Annapolis have been quickly memory hold because they can't fit so easily into a political paradigm. And yet again, Parkland remains at the center of the gun control debate five months later. Why? Well, I think as I've described, because it has so many elements of newsworthiness. It has the human element. It involves a major conflict and a very, very easily identifiable one. And they generated and created micro-celebrities to lead the way, which is essentially what prominence is. And outside of that, they also got major celebrities to support them. All of this makes it the perfect storm of newsworthiness. But the point is, as I mentioned before, in that agenda setting only determines what people think about, not how people think or feel about anything, and as such, often this acceleration of policy and the changes made as a response to it are made in error. It may seem that people are overwhelmingly concerned with a topic to politicians when those politicians are being constantly harangued by the news media asking for their positions on the crisis of the day. And even if they were to poll their voting base, likely they would find said crisis to be of reported concern to the citizenry. Because it is of concern because it's in the agenda that is set by the media. However, that concern doesn't necessarily amount to a freaking hill of beans when it comes to actual public opinion upon said crisis. Just thinking about something does not in any way indicate orientation of opinion. The media determines what is important by showing what they want to show and what they don't want to show. They accelerate the necessity for politicians to respond by putting the pressure on by showing more and more coverage of a given topic. The more coverage they give, the greater they set the public agenda of what people are thinking about. And the ultimate outcome is a screeching cry to high heaven, do something. Ultimately, what ends up happening? Politicians do something. They act before they think. So often, we have seen of late the media and a large number of leftists heavily influenced by it, screaming that, just that, do something, over any number of causes, yet screaming it with no real direction of what need be done, just do something. Those of you who can tolerate my channel while being anti-gun or pro-gun control, and I do appreciate your viewership, just woo lads, I'm not sure how you watch my content. <laughs> You may not understand fully how what I'm describing here applies to Parkland, so let me explain this. The rallying cry, such as I have seen, has been to, quote, ban assault weapons. Now, first of all, I need make note, as I did in the last video in my explanation of gun stock. So once again, let's consult the Holy Book of Armaments, what the fuck assault weapon means. Ultimately, it means nothing. It is a meaningless term. Assault weapon is a political term. It is in no way a term that describes firearms. Let me illustrate. The difference between a scary looking assault weapon like this one and this not so scary looking hunting rifle is really only related to the cosmetic furniture, the magazine size, and the pistol grip. It has very little to do with the weapon's actual functionality. The fact is, regardless though, that neither of these are assault rifles. When people say the term assault weapon, they're usually thinking about, and sometimes on accident actually say it, I'm not sure if it's on accident or not really, assault rifles. Assault rifles are fully automatic firearms, you know, probably with chainsaw bayonets, I would imagine. But the reality is that under the National Firearms Act of 1938, later modified by the Gun Control Act of 1968 and the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986, pretty much no one outside of distributors and a couple of other special cases can possess fully automatic weapons, colloquially what you might call a machine gun. Under this legislation, 
there is no exception allowing for the lawful production, transfer, or possession of a fully automatic weapon made after May 1986 by private citizens. It is illegal to even repair a pre-1986 firearm that is fully automatic with new parts. So when you hear all the shouting to please God somebody do something, why won't anyone ban the machine guns? Please think, think of, of the, the children. children! Well, because machine guns are banned, dummy. This is, this is a fully automatic firearm. As you can see, it's got an auto sear here. When you pull the trigger back, as long as there's ammunition, it'll fire. You don't have to pull the trigger but one time. It's designed that way. This is a semi-automatic. As you notice, none of that material is here. Okay. It'll only fire one time. You can buy these pieces online. So it's not hard to illegally make a firearm out of a legal firearm. Do you see that a lot? See it not often because most people respect the law. Only criminals violate the law. <gasps> Give us your fucking jewelry! And, and, and your Netflix password! I would love to comply, but uh, in the state of California, all of those firearms are illegal. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I did not mean to bring an illegal firearm into your home. I knew this thing was way too military. <laughs> oh my god, I had no idea. As a California resident, I am super thankful you guys are only going to rob me with legal firearms. Illegal. Illegal. Hey baby, is the Glock Gen 4 on the California roster? No. Nope. Illegal. Fuck me! God, it is so hard to be a law-abiding criminal in this state! But you get so wrapped up in the media hype thinking that this issue was important both to the average person and sometimes even to the average politician. Thereby, everyone gets swept up in the momentum of simply doing something for something's sake. And as such, with so many things today, the left, which is fed by this constant stream of media laden with uninhibited spin and intent on acceleration, is it then any wonder that we get an epidemic of Trump derangement syndrome? Anger and outrage, but no real direction at which to channel it beyond screaming helplessly at the sky? Well, really, it shouldn't be. The real problem, though, is not these confused, um individuals parading around with their Trump baby balloon and <laughs> showing off their Trump thumping skills and their impotent rage. It's the city and state politicians who end up being taken for a ride by a false perception created by the media through these various aspects, acceleration, inhibition, and agenda setting, that the public is demanding changes that they simply are not actually demanding. The media has created a false perception and representation of reality, and it is sad that we have seen so many politicians fall for it. Now, maybe I'm actually being quite, I don't know, generous by saying I think they're stupid enough to fall for it and that they are not being paid off or bribed or in some way influenced by the media beyond their own stupidity. But I guess I'm going a little bit Hanlon's razor here in that never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. And I'm not sure which one it is, but today let's go with stupidity or maybe not even stupidity. Because honestly, if you were in this position, it would look to you as if the people were demanding this change. Do something, do something. The media is covering it 24 hours a day, every day a week. It looks like there is a major call being championed for. When in reality, again, it's a false perception. I do need to be clear here before we move forward though that it is not always some sort of malicious intent on the part of the media or everybody involved in the media. I know that that's sort of the thing people want to say, oh, how dare Trump, he's always so mean to the journalists, uh, not like it's unwarranted. But the fact is that not every journalist is as corrupt as, I don't know. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these things simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 
Plenty of journalists are probably just trying to follow that journalistic paradigm of trying to find the greatest elements that make a story newsworthy, of trying to actually do their jobs. I think just as many are politically motivated, but again, hashtag not all. For example though, the media was not responsible, not really, for the potential dangers incurred to Captain O'Grady. They were merely following their inherent imperatives of timeliness, proximity, prominence, consequence, human interest, and conflict. When it comes to something like the Parkland shooting, the story has almost every element needed for a good news piece, as I mentioned, right? Although the tragedy occurred five months ago now, the ongoing protests and demonstrations ensure a consistent timeliness and relevance, as well as proximity and all the other things I've mentioned across various states. It always and continues, as long as this goes on, to have a meaningful place in the news. While in contrast, the passing of a boring local state law, well, how newsworthy is that? Even if the law is exactly what was being called for by that big juicy news story, the law itself lacks said juiciness of a couple dozen teens on stage crying for a change or lying down pretending to be dead bodies in a supermarket. It just doesn't have the same appeal. Just as similarly, it is far more heart-wrenching, it's far more human interest of a story to see a child crying for his parents as he's being separated from them than it is to see the normal operations of a housing facility handing out balanced meals. One of them is just more interesting, it will get more eyes on the screen again. As such, the media sets the agenda not always out of malintent, but rather out of a necessity of the industry. And given the 24-hour nature of the news cycle, a lot of journalists are just looking for whatever is going to get them the most attention, whatever is the most newsworthy. So maybe sometimes the inhibition nature of the CNN effect is not also itself out of malintent. They're not ignoring certain people because, well, they're just not as interesting. Maybe it's just because it lacks some other elements of newsworthiness. Now, I certainly think it is unquestionable that there were political motivations in the examples of Parkland and the separation at the border I just gave, but I do think it is of import that we note that is not always the case inherently. So, at this point we've talked a lot about the potential impact of the CNN effect in its ability to accelerate, impede, and set the agenda in matters that ultimately affect public policy. But is there any empirical evidence for its extents? Baum and Potter 2008, in their review of the literature on the CNN effect, essentially conclude that there is evidence both for and against the hypothesis. For example, in the case of the Rwandan genocide, the media did not function the way that the CNN effect would seemingly suggest that it should have, in that the French government began intervention before the media coverage became overwhelming. And while donations towards humanitarian efforts were greatest during the mass media attention towards the genocide, the media seemingly followed the actions of politicians, rather than the other way around. In contrast, Operation Restore Hope in Somalia is often cited as the quintessential example of the CNN effect in action, which seems to illustrate how media attention to an ongoing humanitarian crisis in a nation sparked US intervention. However, when we look at the timeline, Similarly to the situation in Rwanda, U.S. involvement in the operation began before media coverage became ubiquitous. Similarly as well, it seems less that the news media dictates policy directly, at least in terms of foreign intervention, than it determines what stories are not part of the agenda, that inhibiting factor. This indicates that for U.S. invention in Somalia, for example, the media took their cue from political leaders, rather than the opposite. Perhaps this is because, at least with Operation Restore Hope, the media only sets the agenda, again, in terms of the most important problems, as they depict them in higher frequencies, as we saw in the last video with the research from, for example, Lowry, Neal, and Leitner, 2003. And coverage of Operation Restore Hope accounted for only about 5-6% to of media stories across the board during the years of our involvement. Thus, once again, perhaps it's not just that the media tells us what to think about, but also excludes what we shouldn't think about by just not reporting on it. For example, during this same time frame, around the early to mid-90s, the media dictated around 1-3% of airtime to the humanitarian crisis in the Sudan, which affected about 4 million people. 1-5% to to Afghanistan, which affected similarly around 4 million people, and less than 0.5% on average airtime to the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia, which affected again around 4 million people. Yet, 
news outlets dedicated between 44 and 66 percent of airtime concerning foreign issues on the Bosnian War during the same time period, which affected almost identical numbers of people in the vicinity of 3 to 4 million. The United States' involvement in Bosnia was subsequently much more significant than it was in, say, Ethiopia. However, can we blame that on the CNN effect? Ultimately, Gilboa 2005, in his comprehensive review of the considerable extant body of theoretical and empirical work in the area, finds that, quote, scholarly and professional studies of the CNN effect presently are mixed, contradictory, and often confusing in their results. Page 34. And the theory has yet to satisfactorily specify its parameters or properties. In other words, there seems to be some support for the CNN effect, but just as much support to its contrary. And until we can sufficiently separate it from other media effects like cultivation and agenda setting, it isn't really a fully fleshed out theory. It simply needs greater investigation. And if you go through the literature even to this day, pretty much everyone says the same thing. Let's keep trying to study it. But the problem is that there are so many factors involved in what we talk about when we say the CNN effect. We're not just talking about the media, we're talking about the public and then legislature on top of that. Any good theory needs boundary conditions, and currently, the CNN effect really doesn't have any. Ultimately, integral to the argument for the existence of the CNN effect is the notion that the 24-hour news cycle is fundamentally different from previous formats of distributing news because it transmits dramatic, vivid images to consumers in near real time. And at this point, exactly at real time. It is unquestionable that the current news cycle is disparate from that of the past, where it took days or even weeks to disseminate information. It isn't like World War II, when George Patton would sit around in his tent with six or seven reporters and muse, with the results transcribed and reviewed before being released, remarked Colin Powell on the concept. Going on to state that if a commander, quote, in Desert Shield sat around in his tent and mused with a few CNN guys and pool guys and other guys, it's in 105 capitals a minute later. And this effect has only been exacerbated with time, with the advent of the internet and social media. This is a reality of the current state of the media that is undeniable. Yet, at the same time, it seems that the evidence for the CNN effect as playing a role on policymaking is not so stark as it might have overwhelmingly appeared to be at the outset. At least not in the current research that I have read, most of which concerns foreign policy. Now, I would say the Parkland effect that I described before certainly seems to paint us a picture of the media playing a very significant role in affecting the change of the public in terms of legislation, but not necessarily the public in terms of the opinion of the average Joe. Baum and Potter argue that the CNN effect, to the extent it ever did exist, was a temporary phenomena made possible by the coincidental confluence of new technology and the absence of a coherent geopolitical threat during the Gulf War. But uh, that's an older article, and we've continued to see that, yeah, it does appear that the media plays a role. Maybe it's just not the way that it used to play a role. For example, certainly people have made the argument that 4chan was at least in part responsible for the election of Donald Trump, and while I guess you could call that media, it's certainly not traditional media. Maybe the new gestalt is the meme effect, not the CNN effect, hmm? The fact is that all of these arguments seemingly combine to explain why the CNN effect seems to have had some influence, but significantly less of a transformative impact than early scholarship anticipated. I, however, do tend to disagree, as I've started to state here. While it may be that the so-called CNN effect is not as potent or ubiquitous as initially proposed, it does not mean that individual instances or incidences cannot essentially have the same outcomes as the CNN hypothesis proposes, such as maybe the case with the Parkland shooting or as the case with the children in cages shit, right? Sweeping legislation across the nation with little indication that the momentum is slowing to a significant degree, at least when it comes to the gun control stuff. Is it attracting less mainstream attention than it did in March? Sure, but the demonstrations and protests continue on a mass scale across multiple states in this country, and the laws appear to be changing with them. Thus, I do not think we can entirely discount the potential existence of the CNN effect in certain contexts. Although it may be limited, and it may not be a 
very strong or robust overarching media theory, I think there is some evidence here. It's just a little bit scant. Maybe if we could define those boundary conditions, we could uh, nail it down a little bit closer. In perhaps the most comprehensive analysis of the dynamic interactions occurring in the proposed CNN hypothesis, we should look to Entman 2003's cascade model in an attempt to clarify how information is ultimately spread and potentially affects society, both policymakers and the public. Entman describes the model as designed to, quote, explain how thoroughly the thoughts and feelings that support a frame extend down from the White House through the rest of the system, and thus wins the framing contest and gains the upper hand politically. In the development of his model, Entman observed that much of the literature incorporates the same several steps along the following lines. 1. The government interacts with the media. 2. The media tells people what to believe. And 3. People provide minor feedback to the media. It would seem that this minor feedback is not so much what ends up affecting policy, but rather that occurs in the first step of the process. This would make the supposed CNN effect uniquely different from agenda setting or cultivation, which rely on a unique interaction between the media and the public as the primary impetus, rather than the media and the government as the primary impetus. That would indicate that really, although setting the agenda may have some influence, what really matters is how the media directly interacts with politicians when it comes to long-term effects upon legislation and public policy. That means that rather being a reaction to public outrage, it's very possible that the seeming inconsistency of the CNN effect is a product of the reality that it reacts more significantly with the government directly than it does with public perceptions. And that kind of goes in line with what I've been saying here, right? It's the do something aspect, when in reality, the public doesn't actually want you to do anything. Thus, how should I end this video? Is the CNN effect even real? Potentially, although again, it certainly needs more research. Regardless, what we know about agenda setting and cultivation paints a kind of nasty picture for us of how the media can influence society, particularly a society that is made afraid by said news media on a daily basis, based on what we saw from Lerner and his colleagues in the first video. It is possible that the importance of fear, having not yet been thoroughly assessed in tandem with the CNN effect, could play an important role in how the media coverage affects public perception and then ultimately policy changes, if the public does even play a role in this at all. The facts, however, are undeniable. A major news event occurred, and as a result, numerous policy changes have been implemented. And as such, at least in the instance of Parkland, and again, I think I can call that specifically the Parkland effect, there was an influence of the media on public policy. And by the way, I wasn't the first to call it that. This Huffington Post article also described it by the same title, although I suspect the journalist was not referring to the CNN effect hypothesis I've been describing here. What I really wanted to broach through this video series, though, is the potential effect of the media on policy and legislation, and why it may be that we see such an extreme focus and dramatic outcomes in some cases, as such was the case with Parkland, in some and not in others, as was not the case with many of the other shootings we've seen over the last year and a half. Perhaps you could say Parkland was just the breaking point. People couldn't tolerate it anymore, I guess. But, uh, I'm not so sure about that. I read about... Again, I think you need to take a little bit of a look at the key tenets of journalism and how they potentially interact here. Either way, I believe that while the CNN effect may be in question in its very existence, it is, in contrast, unquestionable that events, particularly events that are emphasized and focused upon by the media, can and do affect public policy in the long term, often in expedited ways that do not allow politicians to fully consider the ramifications of their actions as made evident by the bipartisan dissatisfaction with Rick Scott's gun legislation, for example. Nobody was happy with that. Why do you think that was? Could it be because no one was actually asking for it? And what the left was asking for, they don't even understand? These are the people asking to, quote, ban assault weapons, and yet don't know what an assault weapon is because it 
<laughs> it's a meaningless term. While it is very easy for us to allow the media to influence in some ways, it is thus always important to think about just how the media can influence our opinions, and if not our opinions, at least what issues we are thinking about. Finally, at the end here, I want to give a shout out to Liberal Sanity Project, who reminded me of some of the important and excellent examples that I used in relation to the CNN effect in this video. In addition to just thanking him for his input on this uh, project I've been working on, I think it's also important we sometimes make clear that just because we don't agree on politics doesn't mean we can't work together even kind of be frenzies. <laughs> a lesson maybe we can all relearn from time to time. Anyway, in closing, the CNN effect. Does it exist? I don't know. Maybe. It looks like there's some evidence for it. But either way, whenever you consume media, just be aware of the potential effect that it has, if not on you, then on your local legislature. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altana Volt.